second half of the lecture on anticoagulants and antiplatelets. All right, so we're talking about parenteral anticoagulants, and we'll start with heparin and low molecular weight heparins. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about low molecular weight heparins, we're talking about drugs like anoxaparin. which is generic Lovenox. Um, <clears throat> these are used in the treatment of acute thromboembolism, so to treat things like a DVT, deep vein thrombosis, or a PE, a pulmonary embolism. Um, <clears throat> they can also be used prophylactically, so to prevent the formation of a venous thrombosis. Um, they're used in patients undergoing surgery, for example, hip surgery, like hip replacement, um, knee surgery, like a knee replacement, and then also in some abdominal surgeries. They can be used um, prophylactically in acute MI and also in a subset of hospitalized patients. When patients are hospitalized, they are um, typically immobile. And when you're immobile, you're at risk for venous stasis. Remember that um, when you're walking around, your muscles squeeze the veins, and that helps to push the blood back to the heart to help maintain uh, venous return. Well, when a patient's laying in a bed all day and they're not moving around at all, the, the blood has a hard time getting back to the heart and venous stasis occurs. When there's venous stasis, when the blood is just kind of hanging out in the veins, um, the patient's more likely to form venous thrombi or clots in the veins. So we do multiple things in, in hospitalized patients. Sometimes we encourage movement, right? The person should get up and move around. Um, we can use compression stockings. So like the stockings that actually squeeze the legs in order to act like, like the muscles squeezing the veins. Um, <clears throat> but in some patients, in a subset of patients, we can use things like anoxaparin, um, which is a low molecular weight heparin, prophylactically. Different hospitals will have different protocols for this, um, like when they're going to use anoxaparin, when they're going to use um, compression stockings, etc. Heparin and low molecular weight heparins are really large molecules, um, so they do not cross the placenta. Because of this, they are the drug of choice in pregnant women who need anticoagulation. A lot of the other agents um, are teratogenic or across the placenta and can have adverse effects in the fetus. Um, however, the heparin and low molecular weight heparin like anoxaparin do not. Um, low molecular weight heparin tends to be useful in the outpatient setting because of the ease of use. Um, there's a couple reasons for this. One, it can be given sub-Q. Um, heparin is typically given IV, and that's obviously challenging outpatient. Um, but anoxaparin is given typically given subcutaneously, and that's easy to do. It's sold in pre-filled syringes that can just be injected sub-Q in the outpatient setting. Also, um, the low molecular weight heparins have a much more predictable response, so there's less drug monitoring required. We can typically give the patient the recommended dose, um, let them go and be relatively confident um, that that dose is going to be appropriate to provide anticoagulation without um, anticoagulating too much and having severe bleeding as a side effect. Again, heparin um, is typically given IV. It can be given deep sub-Q, but it's, it's typically given um, intravenously. When we give heparin, we'll usually give an IV bolus to get immediate anticoagulation and then give um, lower doses or continuous infusion. We titrate that continuous infusion to a target um, APTT or activated partial thromboblast thromboplastin time, um, or a target um, anti-10A level. 
Um, anticoagulation happens almost immediately, um, happens within minutes of IV administration. Uh, it takes longer for the low molecular weight heparins to work, so that is an important distinction. However, um, heparin is associated with a very unpredictable response. Um, <clears throat> we don't have one recommended dose that we can just give to the patient and be sure that that's going to be the appropriate dose. That's why we titrate the dose to a specific um, APTT or anti 10 level. Um, <clears throat> so monitoring is required with heparin. Low molecular weight heparin, like anoxaparin, um, is given subcutaneously. It can be given IV in the case of um, an MI, myocardial infarction, but typically we give it subcutaneously. Um, <clears throat> because of this, it takes some time for the drug to enter into the bloodstream and work. Um, so anticoagulation occurs after about four hours of sub-Q administration. The low molecular weight heparins um, are associated with a much more predictable response. We have a recommended dose. Um, so for example, in the treatment of a DVT, we recommend one milligram per kilogram. That's it. Um, and we know that that's gonna give us the, the appropriate um, anticoagulation. So typically with anoxaparin, monitoring is not required. There are a specific subset of patients, though, who have a more unpredictable response for various reasons, um, and in these patients, we do recommend monitoring. So in renally impaired patients, um, anoxaparin is excreted renally. So in renally impaired patients, we do recommend monitoring. Um, in obese patients, and this has to do with the volume of distribution um, of anoxaparin, Anoxaparin has a really low volume of distribution. It does not um, go out into the fat. And we dose based on weight. So if you're, if you're dosing based on weight in a person who's obese, um, you're giving a really large dose. However, the drug is not gonna go out and distribute into the fat. It's going to remain in the bloodstream. Um, <clears throat> so there can be some variations in response there. So we do recommend dosage adjustments in some case and monitoring in obese patients. Um, and then also in pregnant patients as well, we monitor um, anti 10 uh, Also, there's dose reduction recommended in renal insufficiency because again, it is cleared renally. Bleeding is the most common um, adverse drug effect with both of these agents. Really, with any of the anticoagulants, bleeding is, um, is the biggest problem because we're preventing coagulation. Um, <clears throat> in order to watch out for this and treat this, one, monitoring is important. Um, with heparin, we monitor <clears throat> the APTT. Um, and then with both, we monitor the patient to look out for signs and symptoms of bleeding. If bleeding occurs, we can treat it in a couple ways. One, we can just stop the drug. Stop the drug, um, decrease the dose going forward if further anticoagulation is needed. Um, <clears throat> But we can stop the drug. Um, if bleeding is severe, then we can treat it with protamine sulfate. Um, and this is with heparin or with anoxaparin. Protamine sulfate, um, it's really important to titrate the dose appropriately. It's titrated at one milligram protamine sulfate for every 100 units of heparin, or one milligram protamine sulfate for every one milligram anoxaparin. The reason this is important is that um, protamine sulfate can actually act as an anticoagulant itself. So what happens is we give protamine sulfate and that joins with the heparin and it forms an inactive complex. Um, however, if there's too much protamine sulfate and there's protamine sulfate just going through the blood, it's gonna actually cause more anticoagulation and we don't want that. So you don't wanna give too much protamine sulfate. You wanna give just the right amount to join up um, with the heparin that's present. Because 
Heparin um, is sourced from pigs, right? It comes from pigs. It can act as an antigen. Um, the body sees it as a foreign substance and it can stimulate an antigenic response. This can be mild, um, <clears throat> you know, the person can, can exhibit kind of like an infection um, type response, so like chills and fever. Um, they can show an allergic reaction with um, type response, with hives, or if it's really severe with anaphylactic shock. Um, <clears throat> also, because it's antigenic, um, it's possible that heparin and anoxaparin can cause um, a syndrome that's called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Um, this is, again, a immune-modulated response, and it results in a destruction of the platelets, or thrombocytes. So it results in low platelet count, which is thrombocytopenia. Um, <clears throat> HIT is a very serious adverse drug effect. Um, so if HIT occurs on a patient, if you see the platelets plummeting, um, the heparin needs to be stopped immediately. And then because, one, they were already at a risk for clots, hence you were giving them the heparin, the HIT actually can increase the risk for venous and arterial emboli. So if the patient's at a really high clot risk, so you stop the heparin to stop the, the progression of the HIT, and then you need to switch them to another anticoagulant. Um, Argatroban, which we'll talk about next. Argatroban um, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. That's typically recommended. That's typically what we would switch the patient to. Um, you cannot switch them to anoxaparin, to a low molecular weight heparin, because there is cross sensitivity. Okay, so if um, you're, you know, whatever, giving a patient heparin for um, prophylaxis and they or treatment of a DVT, you're giving them heparin and you see the platelets plummet. Um, you stop the heparin immediately and change them to argatroban. Going forward, you cannot give them heparin again um, if they've had a hit. And you also cannot give them a low molecular weight heparin. So in the future, they cannot have anoxaparin either. So contraindications, kind of what we were just talking about. Um, Heparin and anoxaparin or low molecular weight heparins are contraindicated if the person has any hypersensitivity. So if they've had um, an allergic type response and, and um, anaphylactic shock in the past to heparin, they cannot have heparin or anoxaparin going forward. Um, it's contraindicated in bleeding disorders because of course that increases the, the chances of a severe bleed. Contraindicated in alcoholism and in patients who have had recent surgery of the brain, eye, or spinal cord. So um, we just mentioned Argatroban, but we'll spend a little bit of more time talking about some of the details with Argatroban. Um, Argatroban is another parenteral anticoagulant, and it is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Thrombin is the enzyme that converts fibrinogen into fibrin. So that's like the last step in the clotting cascade. Right? We have fibrinogen in the bloodstream and that's a soluble protein. Thrombin is the enzyme that converts it into fibrin. Fibrin is an insoluble protein that's important in forming the actual clot. Um, again, this is the last step in the whole clotting cascade, and um, argatroban inhibits that. So it ends up inhibiting the formation of fibrin. Argatroban um, is typically used in patients who have either had HIT or are at risk for developing HIT. Um, so it's used prophylactically to prevent venous thromboembolism or in the treatment of venous thromboembolism. So treating things like DVT um, or PE in patients with HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Again, the example we just talked about on the last slide was um, patient has a DVT, you start them on heparin, 
the platelets plummet, um, they develop, they're developing HIT, you stop the heparin and change them to argotropan. Um, it's also used in the prophylaxis of thrombi during PCI, um, <clears throat> percutaneous coronary intervention in patients at risk for HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So say the person had HIT in the past, um, they're undergoing a PCI, you're not going to give them heparin again, um, you're not going to give them anoxaparin because of the cross-sensitivity. Um, instead, you would give them argatroban. Um, Bivalarudin Bivalarudin is another drug um, that can be used this way. It's also a, um, it also inhibits thrombin, and it can also be used, or it's used as another alternative in, um, it's used as another alternative in patients who have experienced heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in the past. Um, just some kind of other other little tidbits um, about argatroban. Um, argatroban is synthetic. It's a synthetic agent. It is not derived um, from any animal sources. So that's why it's not antigenic. Synthetic, so not antigenic, so no hit. It's given intravenously, um, so it's associated with immediate anticoagulation. Um, <clears throat> Argatroban is processed by the liver, it's metabolized by the liver, and it does require dose reduction in hepatic impairment. That's different from um, like anoxaparin. Anoxaparin had dose reduction in renal impairment, so that is an important difference. Um, monitoring is required. Um, monitoring with argatroban includes a um, monitoring of the APTT and also the H&H, &H, the hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, and just like with all of the other anticoagulants, the major adverse drug effect is bleeding. Fondaparinux is another parenteral anticoagulant. Um, it's really similar to anoxaparin. Um, it is synthetically derived. And because of that, because it's synthetically derived, it is associated with much less um, of a risk for HIT, for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Um, but its mechanism of action and its use is pretty similar to anoxaparin, which was a low molecular weight heparin. Um, <clears throat> Fondaparinux works by binding to antithrombin-3 and increasing the activity of antithrombin-3 to inhibit factor 10a. Um, factor 10a is one of the factors in the clotting cascade that ends up leading to the formation of fibrin. So factor 10a stimulates clots. Um, antithrombin-3 inhibits 10a. Antithrombin-3 also inhibits thrombin, um, but different anticoagulants that bind to antithrombin-3 um, <clears throat> inhibit either 10A or thrombin or both. So heparin, remember, increases antithrombin 3's activity and it ends up inhibiting thrombin and factor 10A. Anoxaparin was pretty specific for inhibiting factor 10A. Um, Fondaparinox is even more specific. Um, so increases the activity of antithrombin-3 and very specifically inhibits the activity of factor 10A to decrease the formation of fibrin. Fondaparinox is used um, in the treatment of DVT and PE. It's also used in the prevention of venous thromboembolism in patients who are undergoing surgery. So orthopedic surgeries like hip and knee replacements, um, as well as abdominal surgeries. So again, um, indications very similar to anoxaparin.
Um, <clears throat> the Fonda paradox is also given subcutaneously, and it does have a very predictable response. And because of that, it has less monitoring um, than heparin. Again, because it's synthetic, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is much less likely. Um, it still is possible, technically, but it's not nearly as likely as with the heparin agents. Um, Fonda paranox is renally excreted, so it is contraindicated in severe renal impairment. Um, one major difference between anoxaparin and Fonda paranox is that Fonda paranox does not have a reversal agent. Anoxaparin, remember, can be reversed. If severe bleeding is occurring, it can be reversed with protamine sulfate. Uh, Fonda paranox cannot. I read a few studies um, in preparation for this lecture comparing the two. Um, because they are so similar, there are a lot of different studies that say, okay, which one's better, anoxaparin or Fonda paranox? Um, and the studies seem to show that a major difference between them, um, or a difference between them, was that Fonda paranox showed um, or was associated with less bleeding. And that's probably because of its specificity. Um, <clears throat> but that was that was a difference, was that Fonda paranox was associated with less bleeding as an adverse drug effect. Um, <clears throat> But really, that was that was that was it. Uh, <clears throat> but again, just for for you guys to keep in mind, if bleeding does occur, uh, there is no reversal agent for the Fonda paranox, whereas there is uh, protamine sulfate with anoxaparin. All right, so we're going to move on from the parenteral anticoagulants and talk about an oral agent, um, warfarin. Warfarin is classi um, classified as a vitamin K antagonist. Uh, <clears throat> the way that warfarin works is by inhibiting an enzyme that's necessary for vitamin K to help us make clotting factors. The clotting factors, remember, are necessary in the clotting cascade, necessary for us to make fibrin for clots. Uh, vitamin K is, is necessary for us to make those clotting factors. What warfarin does is it inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase, and um, that interferes with the ability of vitamin K to act as a cofactor. And as a result, the factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 are produced with um, decreased activity. So these factors that are produced have between 10 and 40% of their normal activity. So the result is decreased clotting. Um, <clears throat> warfarin is a narrow therapeutic index drug. So the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose are very close together, um, which is important to keep in mind when you're monitoring um, warfarin and adjusting doses or giving drugs that might interact with it. Um, <clears throat> when we monitor warfarin, we monitor something called the INR. Um, that stands for International Normalized Ratio. Um, <clears throat> so we, we dose patients up to a target INR, and then we look at the INR to see if, if we need to increase the dose of warfarin or decrease the dose of warfarin, or if it's really high, possibly skip a dose or give vitamin K, um, et cetera, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, when we look at the kinetics of warfarin, they're kind of complicated. Um, anticoagulation is not immediate, and this is really important when monitoring the drug and adjusting doses. Um, if you give a dose and then you take you um, do blood work and you get the INR, you know, right after you give that dose, the INR is not going to correlate with that actual dose of medication. Um, the peak effect of warfarin is after 72 to 96 hours. Um, it takes, the reason for that is because it takes time for the existing clotting factors to deplete. 
right? Because before you give the warfarin, you've been making clotting factors that are present in the bloodstream that are effective. They work. Um, and you need time for those to be depleted in order for the less active clotting factors um, to be the only factors that are present. Um, <clears throat> It's also important to keep in mind that the reversal takes um, time, it takes about 24 hours for reversal. Um, so if you stop the warfarin, it's not immediate because you have those inactive or less active clotting factors in the blood. Um, it takes the body about 24 hours to make um, new clotting factors um, once the drug is gone. Now, the effects of warfarin can be overcome by administering vitamin K. Um, vitamin K can be given orally, or it can be given um, intravenously. So, for example, um, if you check a patient's INR and it's extremely elevated, um, or the patient is bleeding, in that case, you can give oral vitamin K. Um, the more vitamin K that they have available, um, they can actually overcome the effects of the warfarin and start making clotting factors that are actually effective. Um, and then if it's really high, instead of oral vitamin K, you can actually give IV vitamin K. Um, <clears throat> Warfarin has a wide range of different uses. Um, it can be used in the prevention and treatment of DVT and PE. Um, as far as prevention goes, the prevention of venous thromboembolism after surgery, like after orthopedic surgery, so knee replacements, hip replacements, um, warfarin can be used to prevent the formation of thrombi. Uh, it's also used in stroke prevention in various different settings. Um, so stroke prevention, for example, in patients with AFib who are at an increased risk for clot formation, um, prosthetic heart valves, uh, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, uh, various different indications where patients would be more likely to form clots. Uh, warfarin can be used in order to prevent uh, strokes in these patients. Warfarin is given orally um, and it has typically 100% bioavailability. The half-life of warfarin is highly variable. Um, the average half-life is about 40 hours, which is really long. So you can see that it takes time to get to steady state concentration. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we wait to monitor the INR. It takes time to get to steady state concentration. And again, it takes time for the drug to actually um, to work and for the, the functional clotting factors to be depleted. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. When we look at warfarin, there are multiple different drug interactions that can occur that are clinically important because they can alter the effect of the warfarin. Um, for example, warfarin is metabolized by CYP2C9, and there are norm numerous drugs that inhibit um, and increase the effect of CYP2C9, and those can have clinically significant effects. Um, <clears throat> if you look over here, I've got the drugs listed, so you can kind of look through those. But um, here, there are numerous antibiotics um, or antimicrobial agents present here that can inhibit CYP2C9. So they end up increasing the effects of warfarin. In that case, the patient's at an increased risk for bleeding. Um, this is important clinically because you don't want the patient to bleed. And then this is also important to keep in mind when checking the INR. If, you, if you're monitoring the INR and, and all of a sudden after being stable that it looks strange, um, you can look at recent drugs that the patient has taken to see if maybe that's the reason why. 
if you know another doctor inadvertently prescribed them an antibiotic and they were taking that and um, perhaps that affected the warfarin and affected the INR. Okay, so interactions are important um, to keep in mind for warfarin. The major adverse drug effect um, associated with warfarin is bleeding. Um, <clears throat> and we mon or we, we manage this in, in different ways depending on how severe it is. Um, if the bleeding is monitor is sorry, if the bleeding is minor, um, we hold the warfarin and um, that possibly might be enough. Just hold the warfarin um, and then decrease the dose going forward. Or we can give oral vitamin K to help counteract the, the warfarin that's, that's present. Because remember, it has a long half-life. So it's going to take some time for the drug to leap the system. And it's going to take some time for the body to make new um, clotting factors with that oral vitamin K that you give. Um, if the bleeding is major, then you can give IV vitamin K. Um, the fact that the effects of warfarin can be overcome by administering vitamin K um, is also important for patients to keep in mind as far as their diet goes. So if you have a patient who, um, you know, has never eats any vegetables at all, and then all of a sudden, you know, they really turn their life around and they start eating healthy and they're eating you know, spinach salads every day and they're, they have a huge intake of vitamin K, um, that can actually affect the warfarin um, and you'll see a change in the INR. So it's okay for patients to eat um, things that have vitamin K. That's actually good. A lot of them are healthy. It's okay to have a vitamin K intake. Um, the thing is that it should be stable. They should have a relatively stable vitamin K intake. Um, if it decreases a lot or it increases a lot, that's gonna change the effect that the, that the warfarin is having. Um, other adverse drug effects, um, <clears throat> there's some kind of rare weird things um, that can cause skin lesions and necrosis, uh, something called purple toe syndrome. Um, this is because it can cause the formation of cholesterol emboli um, <clears throat> that can go into the toe and it results in kind of a purplish blue painful toe because of those cholesterol emboli. Um, warfarin is teratogenic, so it is contraindicated in pregnancy. Remember, patients who have to have anticoagulants in pregnancy, we said that heparin and anoxaparin are the drug of choice there, or drugs of choice. Dabigatran. Um, Dabigatran is a oral anticoagulant, um, a direct oral anticoagulant. Uh, it's actually given as Dabigatran atexalate, which is a prodrug, and then that's converted to the active Dabigatran molecule um, by enzymes that are present in the blood, plasma esterases. The mechanism of action of Dabigatran is it is a direct thrombin inhibitor. Um, so argatroban, we already talked about, argatroban is also a direct thrombin inhibitor. It's just that it's given parenterally, it's given IV, um, whereas this is given orally. Dabigatran is used for the prevention of stroke in patients with non-valvular AFib. Again, we just said that um, patients with AFib are at an increased risk of forming clots and having a stroke because of that. So dabigatran is something, um, it's taken orally, so it's something that the patient can use chronically um, for the prevention of stroke. It can also be used um, in patients who have a DVT or PE who have already received parenteral anticoagulants. So you treat the DVT or PE um, with some sort of a parenteral anticoagulant, and then dabigatran is given after that in order to prevent the recurrence of the DVT or PE. Um, <clears throat> dabigatran is contraindicated in patients with 
mechanical prosthetic heart valves. Um, <clears throat> and it's not recommended in patients with bioprosthetic heart valves. So I would just keep in mind, you know, caution, look at it if there's heart valve present. Hence the fact we say it's used prevention of stroke in non-valvular AFib. Um, it's also, <clears throat> oh, we already said that, also used in the treatment of DVT and PV. Major adverse drug effect is bleeding. Um, bleeding is, is typically worse in patients who are elderly, um, so caution in patients over 75 years old um, because of increased risk of bleeding. Um, <clears throat> we can reverse severe bleeding. Um, Idaruziximab. <laughs> Idaruziximab is given to reverse bleeding, again, just if severe. It's associated with GI discomfort. Um, these are really common. So GI adverse drug effects are things that are, they're, they're the most, um, or some of the most common side effects that we see. So things like dyspepsia, abdominal pain, Um, esophagitis or GI bleeds are really common with dabigatran. Um, it's important to keep in mind that dabigatran should not be discontinued abruptly. So, for example, if the person is experiencing, you know, some abdominal pain and dyspepsia and they decide they don't want to take it anymore, they want to take um, or they don't want to take it anymore, then it should be tapered down. It should not just be stopped abruptly because of an increased risk for clot formation when it's abruptly stopped. Other direct oral anticoagulants include drugs that are direct 10A inhibitors, um, apixaban, betrixaban, adoxaban, Rivaroxaban, um, notice they all end in ban. Um, these, again, they inhibit 10A. Um, 10A, active 10A, remember is the enzyme that converts prothrombin into thrombin um, or activates thrombin. And then remember, thrombin is what's responsible for converting fibrinogen into fibrin. Um, so this is just working a little bit earlier in the clotting cascade than the direct thrombin inhibitors. Um, but they inhibit 10A to decrease the formation of thrombin. They can be used in the prevention of stroke um, in non-valvular AFib. They can be used in the treatment of DVT and PE. Um, these ones can also be used to reduce the recurrence of DVT and PE, um, specifically apixaban and um, rivaroxaban, those ones can be used to reduce the recurrence. Um, <clears throat> Betrixaban specifically can be used for the prophylaxis of DVT and PE in at-risk hospitalized patients. Um, we mentioned that before when I talked about anoxaparin, how um, some hospitalized patients are at an increased risk for the formation of clots. Um, <clears throat> venous clots because of venous stasis, and as a result, we need to do some anticoagulation or pr prevention prophylaxis in these patients. Um, Betrixaban is an oral medication that is approved for that use. Um, common adverse drug events include bleeding. There is no antidote available um, if bleeding occurs with the direct 10A inhibitors. Um, renal adjustment is needed. Um, these also should not be stopped abruptly. Um, <clears throat> we just saw that with dabigatran as well, um, but they should not be stopped abruptly. They need to be tapered if you decide that um, they're going to be removed. The patient's not going to take them any longer. Um, these agents are metabolized by SIP enzymes. 
um, and their substrates for P glycoprotein. So clinically important drug interactions are possible. Um, so it's, it's important to keep an eye out for these. And then also there are some over-the-counter meds that actually interfere with these. So things like um, St. John's wort, for example. Um, St. John's wort can inhibit CYP3A4 and can decrease the efficacy of some of these drugs. Um, <clears throat> and St. John's wort's over the counter, so the patient could start taking it without you knowing, and then that would put the person at an increased risk for clots. Um, if, say, they were using it, you know, long term um, or using it like for AFib. So that's really important to keep in mind drug interactions and to warn the patient that they need to let you know about any um, over-the-counter meds that they start taking. I change gears um, <clears throat> now and talk about the thrombolytics. We were just talking about anticoagulants, so drugs that try and prevent coagulation. Thrombolytics come in um, once the clot has already formed. And if you just look at the word thrombolytic, lytic like lice, right? To lice something is to break it apart. Thrombo like the thrombus. So thrombolytic is literally telling us it's lysing the thrombus, right? Breaking apart the thrombus or clot. Um, the thrombolytic agents act either directly or indirectly in order to convert plasminogen into plasmin. Um, and plasmin is the enzyme that comes in and breaks up fibrin. Remember that fibrin is that insoluble protein that forms the substructure of our clot. Um, plasmin goes in and lyses and breaks apart that um, fibrin, thus dissolving and breaking apart the clot. Um, <clears throat> these drugs work best when they're used really early after the clot is formed. Um, the longer the clot stays there, the harder it is to break it apart or to lyse the fibrin. Um, so thrombolytics should be used early, um, and some of them are actually associated with worse outcomes when they're used uh, long after the clot was formed. Now, thrombolytic agents can actually um, cause the formation of local thrombi um, as the clot dissolves. So it's kind of counterintuitive. They're breaking apart the clot that's there, but then the body can form additional clots in that area while that's happening. Um, <clears throat> so strategies to prevent this are when we give thrombolytics, um, we can also give an antiplatelet drug like aspirin. Um, or an antithrombotic, an anticoagulant, such as heparin, um, along with the thrombolytic. And that will allow us to lyse the, the clot that's already there, that's blocking perfusion, blocking blood flow, and prevent the formation of extra clots in the area. Um, here you just kind of see the way that thrombolytics work. Um, <clears throat> again, over here, this is our clot. Right, this is fibrin is forming our thrombus or our clot. Um, plasminogen is an inactive enzyme, and um, plasminogen gets converted into plasmin, and plasmin is active. So, plasmin comes in and it breaks apart this fibrin. It degrades fibrin, degrades the clot, lyses the clot. Um, <clears throat> the way that these agents work, the way that these drugs work, is by increasing this conversion. Um, for example, drugs we'll talk about include things like alteplase and tenecteplase. Alteplase and tenecteplase are um, thrombolytics. They increase the conversion of plasminogen into plasmin, and then we just saw on the last slide that the plasmin digests the fibrin clot. Um, alteplase is what we use to call TPA, um, or tissue plasminogen activator. Right? It 
activates plasminogen into plasmin. Um, <clears throat> but alteplase and tenecteplase both increase uh, the activation of plasmin to digest the fibrin clot. These are used um, a lot less frequently than some of the other agents. For example, like they can be used to treat DVT or PE, um, <clears throat> but they cause serious severe bleeding. Um, so we use a lot of other agents instead or first. Um, <clears throat> so alteplase can be used in the treatment of acute MI, um, massive pulmonary embolism, acute ischemic stroke, and tenecteplase is approved for um, the use in acute MI. Um, <clears throat> just some kind of little notes to keep in mind. Um, for myocardial infarction, um, intracoronary delivery is most reliable compared to IV delivery. Um, but um, <clears throat> there's a there's a short window of opportunity where cardiac tissue can be salvaged. Um, so you know, there's two to six hours they say where it's possible to salvage the cardiac tissue that's downstream from the the clot. So it's hard to get catheterization within that window. Um, <clears throat> if you can get the patient into the cath lab within that window, then you can deliver it um, via intracoronary delivery. However, that's really hard to do. So um, it's usually just given intravenously. Alteplase has a short half-life, so it requires infusion um, after that initial bolus dose. Uh, Alteplase can also be associated with angioedema. Um, and this is worsened if given with an ACE inhibitor. So caution if the person is on an ACE inhibitor, which you guys know already has the risk of causing angioedema. <clears throat> um, both agents are contraindicated in pregnancy, which we've seen for a lot of the agents. Um, again, I will repeat, heparin and low molecular weight heparins are drugs of choice in pregnant patients. Um, these are contraindicated in pregnancy when there's a healing wound that's present, when the person has a history of CVA, um, brain tumor, recent head trauma, uh, intracranial hemorrhage, and metastatic cancer. This is just a summary slide of the antidotes for um, bleeding that's caused by some of the different agents. Um, so you see the, the anticoagulant or fibrolytic, fibrolytic agent here, um, and then this is the antidote or the, the treatment that we would give to treat the bleeding. Um, and then just some kind of additional details about the antidotes. Um, <clears throat> So you can see adverse effects that they might cause and then monitoring parameters that are necessary to monitor as well.